this evening with my talk. My name is Harriet and I work for the Leicester Trim and Wildlife Trust and this evening I'm joined by our Head of Conservation, John Clarkson, who will be telling us all about the reintroduction of large blue butterflies. Before we get going, um, just a few things to fill you in on if you haven't been to one of our online talks before. Um, if you could please pop any questions you have for John in the Q&A box um, during the talk and then we'll go through as many questions as we've got time for at the end. And uh, we are delighted to offer these talks for free, but if you would like to give us a donation to help um, support the costs or um, the cost of putting on the talks and also to support the work we do for wildlife across Leicestershire and Rutland, please head to our website at lrwt.org.uk forward slash donate. Okay, enjoy the evening, everybody. Um, let's see, we've got about 70 of you so far, so that's fantastic. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. I'll now pass over to John and uh, we'll get going. All right, thank you very much and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start to share my screen um, and uh, we'll go into the presentation. <clears throat> so, um, the, the background here is that I, I don't I don't profess to actually being um, an expert on large blue butterfly. And what I am is somebody who was very very lucky. Um, let's see, when would it be? Nineteen eighty nine to have been involved in a large blue reintroduction program. Um, and interestingly, it's one that you won't find any record of. Um, if you however hard you delve um, but I'll explain why that is the case later on but what I want to do um, is actually you know on the basis of, of my experience with with that that summer of uh, of large blue butterflies um, is to give you the bigger picture uh, of the large blue uh, as a as a species uh, and as a conservation success story and I don't know how many of you are familiar with it um, but it's a fantastic story and it's possibly one of the most successful uh, the story is one of the most successful conservation projects probably worldwide really um, you know because it's it's taught us so much so um, what I want to do is to give you an overview of the murder the mystery and the mayhem uh, of the story of the large blue um, and some of those links you'll you'll probably work out already uh, if you know anything about the ecology of the large blue uh, and there are lots of uh, lots of conservation stories here um, within this particular uh, case study um, and some of them are around things like the um, terms that we use such as the inexorability of extinction um, and, and this is a, a classic example of the sort of lessons that we need to learn um, as we face as conservationists uh, the the situation around uh, the world as it stands just just before the um the the, the talk this evening um, i don't know how many of you look at the bbc website and on the science page there's a a little story about the harpy eagle um and uh, the almost inexorability of the extinction sadly of the harpy eagle in uh, in certain areas of brazil because uh, in the same way, the amount of forest uh, has declined, it, it is declining um, to such an extent that it's crossing a tipping point uh, for the uh, uh, for the harpy eagle. Um, and here, um, this is another, sorry, let me go back here one step. Um, this is an example of a, of, a, of a story where we're at the forefront of scientific discovery, or at least this was and still are uh, in many respects. Um, it's also a story of evolutionary hostages. Um, and I'll mention those because, again, you know, we, we look at conservation sometimes with uh, uh, looking at it from two ends of a spectrum. One is that it's very simple, everything, every little helps. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, it's incredibly scientific. Um, and it's quite remarkable. I, 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 it never ceases to amaze me that what we're dealing with here, particularly in the large blue, is that it's a fantastic species, which we call uh, a species exhibiting uh, micro niche, what we call micro niche dynamics. So it's reliant upon so many different things being absolutely right in the right space of time. And I'll give you an example of that, okay? Um, I want you to imagine that you're standing at a taxi rank, and, and a, I mean a taxi rank, and you're waiting for a bus. 
and the, the, dis the disparity there. You're at a taxi rank waiting for a bus to pick you up. You don't know which bus is going to pick you up and you don't know whether it's the right bus that's going to pick you up. But you hope that at some stage your bus picks you up. So you're already hostage to something which is not necessarily what you thought might be occurring. So you hope actually the bus doesn't come along. That bus has to take you to a market and not just any supermarket. It has to be a special supermarket. It has to be a supermarket that's going to keep you alive for the next nine months. And it's going to keep you alive because there is only one source of food in there. And so you have to be taken to exactly the right sort of supermarket with exactly the right amount of food of the right type uh, and at the right time. You go too early, you're in trouble. You go too late, you're in trouble. Anybody else in that supermarket, you're dead. Um, and it's all these sorts of really, really interesting stories um, that, 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 that are part of the fascination of the large blue. Um, so there, we talk about these evolutionary hostages. Um, and there's a story here about cliff-ledged survival, both um, in a, a metaphorical sense um, and in a realistic sense too. Um, so it's, it's a really fascinating conservation story and it's a success story that I want to take you through over the next 45 minutes. And there's a lot of Sherlock Holmes in here too, the murder, the mystery and the mayhem. Uh, and you can almost, I'm sure, you know, somebody ought to make uh, some sort of story out of this, however they want to, whatever analogues they want to use. Starting point, um, you might, some of you might be familiar with this uh, particular uh, story from uh, nearly a couple of years ago. And I must say actually that this, the starting point is there's a reason why I'm doing the talk now. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the large blue, it's a fabulous butterfly. Um, and there's a picture of it there. It's actually bizarrely, it's not a large blue butterfly. It's actually quite a small blue butterfly. Um, it's just that the spots you can see, hopefully, um, you can see some big black spots on the top of the forewing there. Um, and it's because it's got these big large blue, the large dark blue spots and this large dark blue band around the forewing that we call it the large blue, even though it's about the same size really as a common blue. So it's about 13 to 15 millimetres in length uh, and it has a wingspan of about, um, uh, I think it's somewhere between 30 and 50 millimetres, depending on um, a male or female and how old and how decrepit and things like that. Um, and it's, it's at this stage of the year, right now, um, it's, it's, it's coming out as an adult um, and uh, it's reaching its peak flight period. So that's why it's timely. Um, and if you get the chance to go, then it would be well worth a trip to uh, places like Collard Hill um, in Somerset, which is the, the site, the very public site to go and enjoy the large blue. So that's why we're doing it now, because this is the time when the large blue is at its most numerous. Um, and as I say, you might remember that you might have noticed this, this story from last year, no, sorry, no, 2018, um, when we had the very, very best summer uh, of large blue butterflies. And I think there were, if I remember rightly, there were something like 25,000 uh, on the wing uh, in 2018, just to give you a sense of the numbers. Uh, and that's remarkable for a butterfly which went extinct in 1979 um, and was reintroduced in 1983. So, uh, that if you want, if you want to know more about this uh, th this story of the large blue butterfly, then um, I really do encourage you to, uh, if you if you are not subscribers or, or if you are, I encourage you to, to to get hold of a magazine called um, British Wildlife. It's a brilliant uh, periodical. Comes out every other month, um, and there are there are three editions here which cover the large the story of the large blue, and you'll see the very very first edition of British Wildlife. Uh, carried uh, a, a long story uh, about the large blue butterfly and um, then in October 2019 um, they had a 20-year a, a catch-up uh, on, on the large blue. So uh, you know th this, th th the edition in October 2019 is, is the best one to read because it's a really fascinating story um, and you'll get lots more than, than that which I'll cover uh, now. 
Uh, right, so um, without further ado, I just want to give you a quick overview and please, if there are any questions or anything like that, as, as Harriet says, pop them in the, uh, in the Q&A box um, because I'm happy to, to, uh, to answer any questions. Just to give you some perspective, um, our large blue, uh, uh, I refer to as Maculinia arion, um, is one of six new species around the world, and you can see uh, kind of the distribution of our large blue um, across Western Europe in green there, um, covering 37 countries, um, give or take, um, and it, the numbers have declined by more, well, anywhere between 50 and 80 percent over um, the last 50 odd years. Uh, five, about 10 years ago, the population uh, was considered to be stable in only seven of those countries, uh, as an indication that, you know, you've probably all heard of the stories of the, in, the, the insect apocalypse and the decline of invertebrates, and the large blue is another example of that. It's a remarkable species which, uh, frankly, uh, I simply don't understand how it exists when we think about um, the, the, the fact that it is hostage to so many fortunes. Uh, it's quite a remarkable story of ecology. Um, and you can see there that in most most countries there are actually, or there were, actually fewer than 10 colonies of large blue butterfly. So you get a sense of the, the, the cliff ledge survival um, that actually many of these colonies uh, are um, what we might call temporary. Um, they switch on and switch off. Uh, according to things like the, the weather, uh, the climate. They're kind of adapted to um, cool, wet summers <coughs> and fairly mild winters. And if the situation, if the conditions are not right, then the entire colony might disappear. Um, globally, it's now considered to be a near threatened species. Um, actually, five years ago, it was considered to be an endangered species. So things have got better, um, but they're nowhere near as brilliant as they could be. So um, coming to this um, Agatha Christie sort of uh, story, this uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of story, uh, I want to take you through here the, the curious case of the butterfly, the ant and the time, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, so um, we have the large blue butterfly there on the left, and I do apologise to those taxonomists amongst you who will realise that actually it has a different scientific name now, um, Fengarian. Um, and uh, you get a sense of what the large, this magnificent butterfly looks like. And I've been really lucky enough to have one in my hand uh, as part of that reintroduction programme. Um, it has a relationship with a, a, a particular species of ant, uh, Myrmica sabuleti, um, and it's not that it can't exist with the others, it's just that this one is the one uh, within which um, it has the best chance of survival. Um, so if you like, Myrmica sabuleti is the supermarket, um, or at least it's the ant nest is the supermarket. Um, and then we have this relationship with, uh, with the thyme plant, and it's the thyme plant upon which the butterfly lays its egg. Um, but intriguingly, and I'll mention this later, time and time again, Myrmica sabuleti has no interest in thyme plants. So this is where the rank and the bus comes along. The, the, the actual ant is the bus, um, and you're at a taxi rank, the thyme plant, hoping that this bus will come along and pick you up. And I'll talk about that more a bit later. Now, I apologise, this looks like a very complex slide, but it's actually quite simple and it's really, really important. It's a fantastic example of how science has transformed our ability to conserve species. Um, and the, I have to give uh, credit, I mean, everybody has to give credit to Jeremy Thomas. He's the guy who single-handedly, I suppose, um, has saved large blue butterflies um, as a species in the United Kingdom. Um, and he is one who's done all of the research really, um, all the way back from when he started, I think he started his PhD possibly, was it 1968, something like that, um, on large blue butterflies. Um, and he's, so he's the god of the ecology. Um, and so what we start, if we start off with the top left, um, as I said before, you know, we're now at this period where the adult, the imago, um, is emerging from the ant burrows um, 
and crawling down uh, down the slopes, crawling up the stems of grass, uh, filling its wings, warming up, uh, and then flying away. The males and then the females uh, meeting and mating, um, and you have the, the female then laying eggs on the thyme plant. Um, the position, as it says there. Um, and the point of the little uh, hieroglyphics um, underneath each of the words in this are part of a mathematical formula, which I'll come back to later on, because these are all stages that are critical uh, in the life cycle uh, and the success of the large blue butterfly. So you'll see there, oviposition, VW uh, in brackets. Um, and so we've then got a risk of uh, how many eggs are actually laid on the time plant and whether they're lay laying on exactly the right time plant. This is another hostage that I, I forgot to mention. You need to be you know, at the right kind of bus stop. Uh, actually, you need to have been born on the right kind of bus stop. There's an element here of mortality on the thyme plants. If the female doesn't lay her eggs on the thyme plant when it comes into exactly the right kind of flowering condition, the eggs won't, once the eggs have hatched, uh, the, uh, the larvae won't actually feed if they're not, if the plants in, aren't in the right condition. So they might actually starve on the plant. We then come to the bit about the taxi rank and the bus and the fact that you need to be cap captured, carried by the right kind of bus. Um, and it turns out that uh, within this landscape, um, the, the, the preferential bus is, mur is Myrmica sabuleti, but there are chances too that you might be collected by Myrmica scabrinosis, which is another ant which might also be in the same and we'll touch upon that later. So there's an aspect here about host specificity um, and this occurs somewhere in what we call the fourth instar uh, for the larva of the cat of the uh, of the butterfly. Somewhere between um, early June, well early July rather, um, and early August. So uh, the larva kicks around for about nine days before it's taken down um, into the ant nest which could be meters away um, and it's going to spend all of the winter um, uh, as a larva uh, in the ant nest and then there are risks here hence the density dependent mortality which I'll come back to later on but basically there's only room for one large blue larva in an ant nest. Um, if there are too many if there are too many large blues in an ant nest then they probably will all die. It's not just one of them but they will probably all die uh, because the ants will turn upon them. Um, and there need to be enough uh, ants because what the large blue larva does is it feeds on the ant grubs. So they need 350 ant grubs as a minimum uh, within a nest to support them over winter. So there's density dependent mortality there. Um, and then, of, then I talked about the weather. And one of the really interesting challenges that, that has, has beset this whole program of reintroducing large blues is this critical period um, in uh, May and early June. Um, when the larva, the larva is turning into a pupa and um, if it's too dry, um, you know, that we have too dry, too warm, too dry a spring, then uh, the, during this critical stage, the, uh, the butterfly might die within the nest. So you can see that there's all sorts of uh, death uh, and mayhem going on in the life cycle here before uh, the pupa be has an opportunity even uh, to become an adult. Um, and only fly for uh, a few days. So very, that's that's very quickly uh, an overview of the uh, of the ecology. Um, so yeah, question: Why do the ants take the larvae into their nest? Uh, and I'll, I'll come on to that, Heather, uh, in a wee while. It's a really important question. Um, and to a certain extent, it's again, it's another example of this fantastic evolution uh, and how you know, I, I find it remarkable how these species have evolved uh, to take advantage of these opportunities. And because it's quite, it's so bizarre. You know, why would this butterfly evolve to be captured by an ant? 
Um, what's in it for both of them? Why would the ant pick up the butterfly? What's in it for them? And I'll touch on upon that later. Now, one of the critical things is um, that the habitat, you have to have the habitat absolutely right. And again, here's a really interesting story, which I'll kind of touch upon in all sorts of places, um, because one of the reasons why the large blue went extinct um, is because conservationists made so many mistakes in trying to get this right. Uh, in fact, you know, we were our own worst enemies um, in terms of mismanaging the, the habitat. And, and it was decades before we actually worked out that what they prefer is south facing closely cropped turf. So this is um, this is Green Down in Somerset, which is the site with possibly the, the, the single largest colony of large blues. Um, and uh, my, my connection with this site is that um, I helped manage this and I, I created, I, um, I put up a fence um, all the way through this so that the, the Somerset Wildlife Trust could graze it properly um, when, because they acquired it when, when, I, when I started working there. Um, and the idea is to get this very shallow, uh, this very shallow turf to have a very short crop of grass and thyme on top of it because the temperature of the soil is critical. If the temperature is too hot, you don't have Myrmica uh, sabuleti. Uh, if it's too cold, you don't have Myrmica sabuleti, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon that later. And it's also critical for the thyme plants too. So you absolutely have to have um, the, 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 the conditions to be to be right. Now, as it turns out, the large blue is evolving even now, uh, and we're finding that actually um, Myrmica sabuleti and thyme and the large blue will survive on flatter surfaces. But that's only, you know, because uh, things are changing and evolving. And it's a really interesting part of the story. So just pushing on, um, you then have to, uh, within that landscape, you have to be, remember you're a butterfly which is looking for thyme plants. Um, and what you can see here is uh, that a very, very, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the size of a thyme plant and the flower, um, but it's tiny. So you're looking at something which is l kind of about less than the size of your thumbnail, obviously depending on how big your thumbnail is, um, and that's the flower of a thyme plant. And you can see within that, that white little ball, it's a bluey white, it's a beautiful bluey white. Um, it's indented almost like the, I don't know whether you've seen the Bullring shopping centre, um, and it's, it's just a beautiful egg, one to two or three millimetres across. It's the size of a pinhead. Um, and technically, really, the, the large blue will only survive if there is one egg on one thyme plant, because there's only really enough one food, one, only enough food um, on the thyme flower to support one larva, really. So the female has to fly around looking for thyme plants in exactly the right condition, and, and this is not the right condition actually. Um, and she needs to find she needs to find plants that don't, which don't have an egg upon them, so that she can lay an egg. Um, and one of my jobs was to search the landscape on, on, a, on this particular nature reserve um, to look for the eggs. And I searched 20,000 plants and found one egg. Um, and, uh, the, and this is this isn't actually a picture of it, um, but uh, it, it is exactly what I what I found um, when I was uh, when I was looking for them. How is the grass kept short? Um, yeah, and I'll come on to that because that's again, you know, Lucy, a really really important part of the story. Um, so uh, it's a mixture of sheep and cattle. Uh, sorry, I should have said that you know the cat, the cattle as well as the the, the, the sheep. Um, it's a mixed livestock grazing, and again, that's part of the story here. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's a, an, an indication of what I was looking for. I checked 20,000 plants um, and I'll come on to the number of eggs that the female lays because again that's really really important. So the eggs hatch after about after 7 to 14 days depending on conditions. 
Um, they go through a number of what we call instars, so it's stages of development. Um, and the first two instars feed inside the flower. So what they're literally doing is kind of chomping away um, and feeding on uh, on the, the, the actual flower. Um, and it may well be, you know, depending on the size of the flower, that they need to move to a new flower. But it, you get the picture there that there isn't room for another larva uh, on an individual flower. So again, they're hostage to, you know, the fact that how did it survive? You know, how did it evolve to become an organism which is adapted to only, you know, a particular size of plant? The fourth instar then uh, uh, drops down to the ground um, at about this sort of length, as you can see there, four millimetres in length to give you a sense of scale and it drops down to the ground to wait, literally wait for an ant. So um, we, we come on to this, this question then about uh, what's in it for them and what's in it for the ant. Well it's all about, for the, for, for the butterfly, it's about food, uh, the larvae, the ant, feeding on the ant larvae in the, in the nest. Um, for the ant, um, what's in it for them is actually this is about mimicry and deception. Um, so what happens is you can hopefully you can see that in around about the third cell along there's a swelling and um, basically what happens is that the larva uh, starts to secrete some chemicals uh, from a special gland called the newcomer's gland which uh, it kind of change shape and it resembles uh, an, an ant larva grub. So it's deceiving the ant. So what's in it for the ant? The ant thinks that what, oh, somehow one of my brethren has got out. I need to take them back to the nest. Um, little knowing that actually what they're bringing in is an interloper that is going to kill all of the babies. Um, but nonetheless, the worker ant is doing its duty. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, all good ants would do. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it doesn't know, uh, obviously, what's going to happen. So as the fourth instar um, growing up to 15 millimetres, it then is taken away into the nest. Uh, it spends the winter uh, merrily chomping on all of the grubs um, and it may feed on up to 500, depending on the size of the nest. And as, a, you know, as I said before, the critical thing here um, is that uh, there's a minimum of 350 grubs. Um, to, to, for survival um, and there's only room for one larva in any particular ant nest um, and there's actually only room for generally either one large blue larva or one ant queen um, you know so there's a bit of a kind of a competition going in there um, so the large blue won't survive if the ant queen um, it, you know if its deception fails and the critical thing here is that the the larva produces a masking scent to mimic that grub whilst it's in the nest. So the uh, the animals actually ignore this uh, this larva because they think it's one of their queens. Um, so they, they 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 just simply, in fact, help it on its way. Um, and then we go through the pupa forming in the formed in the chamber, and then there's this is really really remarkable story where um, actually you might see some videos of a, you know, of actually a um, a a fleet of ants picking up um, the uh, the pupa as it be becomes an imago. Um, so it's not that it just crawls out, um, but actually you will see that the, the ants begin to take it out. Um, carrying it on their backs out, out, out into the wider world. Um, and, then, and then what it does is, is it climbs the vegetation, grow, climbs to the top of the, the tallest grass that it can, unfurls its wings, dries them, um, and then, um, then it flies, they both fly down, males and females, uh, they fly to the bottom of the slope. So um, there's a really interesting story here about you know, kind of the, 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 the day, the time of day in which they fly. So the, ma the males try to get to the bottom of the slope as soon as they possibly can. Um, when in fact they don't get to the bottom, what they try to do is intercept the females before they get there. Um, and the females fly to the bottom so that what they can then do is they fly uphill um, searching for thyme plants. So they do it systematically, um, hopping from to plant to find them that haven't had eggs laid upon. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if the first females have got there, then uh, the, the, the following females can begin to just ignore 
um, the, uh, the, air, the, the thyme plants because they, they can quickly detect that there are eggs upon them. Um, <clears throat> and so after an hour, the female lays an egg um, and their lifespan is only five to seven days. And actually it's probably even shorter. So I, the, 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 again, the hostage to fortune uh, on the site I was uh, involved with, actually um, it was the most horrendous summer uh, of in humongous downpours right at this time of year, just when the large blues were flying. Um, we just had days and days of rain and the only adults I came across were ones that were completely rain battered, uh, the poor things, they were really struggling. Um, and that's an indication of the challenge that, you know, that these organisms face. So that's a, a quick overview of the, um, you know, kind of the ecology. And I realise I'm well behind where I want to be. As always, the students were, you know, apoplectic with me because I would always try to fit two hours into one hour. So um, apologies, I've got a very, very long story and I'm going to try and get through it um, quite quickly. But this is the, the, you know, the murder, the mystery, the mayhem, the, the fantastic story here. Um, and one of the key things is the tyranny of small decisions. I like these conservation mantras. And I'll touch upon these. Um, and there are some really important things. The picture on the, the typical large blue landscape. Um, and um, one of the real problems we had is that we lost that kind of landscape for a variety of reasons, which I'll touch upon. And we still don't have it. And we need to recreate that. Um, and we need to recognise that that landscape is a transitional one. Um, that it moves from place to place. One of the tyrannies is about cows. Cows are really important because they don't crop so short as sheep. Um, they, they kind of rip the vegetation. So you get, you kind of get slightly longer patches and shorter patches and you get bare earth patches. Um, and then there's a whole history here about uh, the decisions that conservationists took uh, in trying to conserve the large blue, which I'll touch upon. So it's important to know the history here. Large blues, you can see from the picture in the middle, large blues actually existed all the way up, up into Northamptonshire, up until the end of the 19th century. Um, and actually their greatest number was probably on the what's called the North Atlantic coast of Cornwall and Devon. You can see there, there were 33 sites, possibly many more. Um, I was just reading a little story earlier on about how many sites there were. Um, and in the in kind of the more recognised sites, the Poldens that we know of, um, so where Collard Hill and Green Down are, um, a very, very small number of sites historically, uh, and plenty of sites in the Cotswold too. Now there's a really interesting perspective here, which there's a potential suggestion that there were two different types, if not more, of large blue uh, in the landscape. And I'll come on to why that might be later. Um, but anyway, you, hopefully you get a sense of the distribution. Um, now, and this is where, you know, kind of some of the mayhem and the murder comes in, because of course, large blues were fanta are fantastic butterflies, and they were really, really treasured by collectors, because each one is an individual, different patterns, um, and they were really valuable, and people would go and collect them, um, and, and, you know, people in their 10s and 20s and 30s would travel huge distances. You can see here a typical story, um, leaving from London to take a, a, a a train to Dartmouth um, and then catching a steamer to go around the coast to Sulcombe and walking 10 miles to Bolt Head um, and just to collect large blue butterflies to make sure you were the first one to collect this particular colour morph and you can see there um, that uh, you know they were so popular eight butterflies were sold for, for two guineas because they were that valuable um, and there are thousands of specimens in the museum so you can imagine you know loads of people wanted to be the first um, you know eagerly anticipating the collection of large blues and the best sites and working out which were the sites to go to. Um, and so there was a real concern that um, butterfly collecting was leading to, uh, to the decline, you know, because they'd already realised by 1895, they'd realised that the numbers of large were declining quite markedly. Um, and this uh, uh, really famous entomologist, Frohawk, uh, and colleagues, um, they they, they recognised this and they made it their mission, 20 year mission. Frohawk actually, he had a personal mission to, to raise 
uh, to collect and raise every single species of British butterfly, but focused on the large blue in particular. Um, and for all sorts of reasons, in nine, um, they went through a whole raft of different processes. Um, um, SPNR, if you're familiar with that, one of uh, our predecessor as an organisation from which the Wildlife Trusts were established, the Society for Protection of Nature Reserves, and set up alongside uh, Charles Rothschild. Um, you know, and they and a number of other organisations got together in 25 to to establish a committee for the protection of British Le Lepidoptera and focus especially on the large blue. Um, and um, they, they didn't know, you know, they knew large blues were declining, but they didn't know how to conserve them. And there were all sorts of issues. And what they did, they tried to create some nature reserves to try and stop the decline. Um, and actually, you know, what happened was that um, they, they stopped, uh, what the, the landscape was being protected because uh, there were fires, it was a gorsy landscape, and there would be natural fires keeping the, the open patches. And what they did, they stopped the fires because they thought they were burning the butterflies. And of course, what that meant was the amount of gorse increased instead of being under control. They, they thought that the cattle, um, you know, this was a Cornish landscape which had got gorse um, and coastal heathland and cattle grazing and, you know, lowly wandering through the meadows. Um, and they started to remove the cattle because they thought the cattle would be trampling on the butterflies and that would be bad. So they removed the cattle as well. Um, and um, then one of, the, one of the critical things they did, they created this nature reserve at the Dizzard. And what they did was they said, actually, what we need to do is just shut the gate um, and remove people and remove the cattle and stop the fires. And actually, un understandably, the site scrubbed up, it gorsed up, the grass became too long. And the large blue disappeared by 1939, hence the phrase killed by kindness, the curse of good intentions, um, because they just simply didn't know what the right thing to do was. Um, at that time, there were loads of people going around, I forgot to mention, um, I might talk, touch upon this later, um, but there were loads of people going around digging up large blue larvae in the ant nests. Well, actually, they were digging up every ant nest to try to find large blue larvae because they wanted to be the first person who could grow a large blue adult from a larva. Um, so the landscape was littered with ant nests being dug up by human beings. Um, so you can see this kind of mayhem kicking around in the countryside as, as they realised that the species was falling through the fingers, through the gaps in their fingers. Fingers, um, and they drop it and they just didn't know what to do. Um, so by 1950 there were 25 populations um, and in 1962 a special committee was set up uh, to conserve the large blue and of course everything failed. Um, there were only two sites left in 1972 with 325 individuals and it became uh, extinct in 1979. Um, and the real problem was that the last site, I, I've been lucky enough to go to Cytex, the last site um, is effectively the last site you would ever think you would find a large blue. If you went there you would go how on earth are large blues here because it was in the middle of a forestry plantation, it was a north facing slope, it was full of gorse, it was full of large grass and it was like everything that was not the ecology of large blue and yet we were designing our conservation story around site x we were working on the premise that because it was still at site x it must be this must be the ecology that was good for large blue um, but of course the curse of good intentions we got the story completely wrong so ignore the the, the, the chart on the right uh, in a sense the chart on the right shows that the extinction was nothing to do really with area, um, it was nothing to do with isolation, um, but we can use those to determine the, the, the time to extinction. Um, <clears throat> but it was about you know the, all of these things that didn't go right. Um, so what you saw was this negligible de decline to extinction. By 1979, Jeremy Thomas started in 1960, started doing loads of fantastic research in 1970 um, and lo and behold in 1978 79 he had that ha ha moment when he suddenly realized and completely discovered the final piece in the jigsaw 
the year before it went extinct. Um, but that was that was sufficient for him to go, you know what, I now know how we can reintroduce it. And that's what he did in 1983. Um, and as you can see, what's happened since then is the population has uh, has rocketed fantastically. So the, the, this kind of story then is one of the curse of good intentions, where we fenced off the nature reserves to prevent the grazing, we stopped burning the gorse, and um, we also had people, you know, people thought that rabbits were bad, um, and they, you know, so the, the, the landowners were getting the root of the rabbit. But the rabbits are called because we were removing the cows um, and the rabbits were keeping the grass short. So when myxomatosis struck in 53, that also led to a massive decline in large blue butterflies. Serendipity and the curse of good intentions and the tyranny of small decisions. Nobody, nobody chose to stop to stop having cattle as an individual. Um, you know, uh, in, in, sorry, in a UK context, nobody said stop farmers. We don't need cattle anymore. Um, it was just loads and loads of small decisions because cattle farming obviously became less and less economic. Um, cattle farming went into decline. And of course, there was incessant agricultural improvement and changes of crops and all that sort of stuff. And as I say, um, this set element of serendipity, the, the, the final piece in the jigsaw was only discovered in 1978. So we've got this fantastic conservation success story, which I'm going to lead you into uh, right now. Two guineas in today's money. <coughs> yes, well, a guinea is one pound and five pence. So, um, uh, I, obviously, I can't, I can't give you what two guineas would be if we uh, actually use that in today's money by accounting for, you know, kind of inflationary pressures and all that sort of stuff, I'm afraid. <coughs> but it would be an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to, uh, to actually calculate. So uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm already well over time, aren't I? Uh, I'm going to whiz through, um, you know, kind of the other elements of the conservation success story. <coughs> just bear with me whilst you just take a, a quick sip here. So we come back to Fro Hawk, Purifoy and Chapman in 1895, undertaking their, <coughs> their research. And they were the first to discover this ant association. And literally what they did <coughs> was um, they went back every year to a very, very specific site to chart the progress of the butterfly into its larvae. Um, and they, only, they, they never found a fourth stage and they never understood why. They only ever found third stages and they kept going back to this particular spot until they found uh, um, an ant taking this, this final larva and they followed it into an ant nest. And then they went back the following year and dug up the ant nest and found a grub uh, within that ant nest. Um, and so this is this, this fantastic dedication uh, to finding out about the ecology. Um, so, you know, it's remarkable that we knew much of the story, even at the turn of the 20th century, 19th, 20th century, <coughs> but there were still bits missing. And Spooner took some, undertook some more work, which kind of led to the, the understanding that it was a particular ant rather than, you know, any form of ant. Because nobody actually knew then that it was only one form of ant. Um, and it was Jeremy Thomas in 72, 78 that actually looked at much more about the ecology um, and found all of these variables. And the, the 18 parameters that lead to uh, the, the, the success or failure, if you like. So um, hostage to fortune, as I said before, you know, it only only lives in warm, arid, unimproved grassland. And the adult only disperses about 250 metres. They are rubbish at flying. Um, for such a butterf beautiful butterfly, they really are rubbish. Um, and so you've got this issue about, well, how do they recolonize the landscape? Within this landscape, there could be any one of five ant species. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, there are little charts for four of them. Um, and it, they are only really found um, uh, they only really survive where Myrmica sabuliti is found. Um, and Myrmica sabuliti is only found where uh, the short, where the grass is really, really short. Now, the bizarre thing is that Myrmica sabuliti does not exist where most of the time plants exist. So you're really hostage to remember this bus. That bus shouldn't be where you are. Um, you know, it really shouldn't be there um, because it, it's in the wrong place. Um, they much prefer shorter grass um, without time, where very few time plants exist. So you're hostage to things like the drought, as I mentioned, the rabbits, and the coexistence of these other factors. 
The really bizarre thing is Myrna Cassabuliti is not interested in time. It feeds on the seeds of violets and bugle. Isn't it bizarre? How did this species ever come to evolve um, because of all of these you know, kind of curious circumstances? And who, how on earth did people find this out? And this is the work that Jeremy Thomas and David Simcox and others have done. So you're then hostage to the ant. You only, you can only survive as a queenless, effectively a queenless colony. Um, no other large blue within there. Um, you know, so, and because partly the, the, the queen ant exudes suppressing chemicals, you know, prevents other queens from existing, and the workers attack other proto queens. Hence, the, the large blue larva, you know, kind of emits chemicals and it hums uh, to pacify the uh, worker ants. Um, and the critical thing here is this po what's called post-instar, post-instar 4, uh, larval mortality. The very fact that it's random chance, in a sense, that the, the larva survives for nine months in the ant nest for a whole raft of different reasons. And then you're hostage to numbers. Um, the Murma assembly in eating nests, you need at least one, if not three, per square metre. Um, and you need 68% of the larvae in a population of large blues to be adopted um, for the population to be sustainable. So you need 68%. If every adult butterfly were to lay, should we say, one egg that becomes a larva, um, then, you know, 68% of those 400 need to be adopted in order to have enough adults next year. In fact, it's more complicated than that, but you get a sense of the numbers here. So within this landscape, you need a landscape of at least four hectares. Um, and it's better if it's 10 to 20. So that's 10 to 20 football pitches of a short turf height um, and an, an awful lot of adult butterflies. And the really critical thing here is, do you remember I mentioned, these need to be laid at an absolutely critical time uh, on the time plant. Um, so the little chart at the top right there, um, one of the things I had to do was to count the number of flowers, individual flowers, um, in the different stages. Um, and there's something called stage two, which is the optimum stage. So the egg needs to be laid just before most of the flower heads come into stage two, so that the egg then hatches just as the flower heads come into stage two, rather than go into stage three. If they're already over, it's too late. If it's too early, then stage two won't come before you die of starvation. So you can see there's a critical thing here about the timing of the time in which time plants are flower. Um, and the adult large blue needs to emerge at exactly the right time to lie, lay its eggs on the time, time plant. So we're then hostage to the weather um, and the fact that the ant nests, are, their density is affected by cool, wet summers and spring droughts. If it's too cool, then the number of dent, ant dent nests is too small uh, for them to survive. They don't collect enough eggs. They don't have enough larvae. The flight period is only five to seven days over four weeks. So if it rains like it did with me, you know, they're really in trouble. The female may only fly for four days and she only lays 51 eggs at most. And if it's a rubbish summer, she will only lay maybe 25 eggs, maybe even fewer. There is no compensation. She only lays as many as she can lay, as you can see there. Maybe only eight in very dry summers, maybe only 11 in very wet summers. Um, and of course, you know, you're then looking at 68% of those 11 to be adopted, etc, etc. Um, and if it's really, really dry, the female has a very, very short dry flying period because, you know, they are butterflies. Um, and they have a real problem with, you know, kind of water and stuff like that. They just dry out and lose energy. Um, and if the turf is taller um, and the, the, the ant nest temperatures decline, then you get other ants instead. So there's a real, really, really important challenge here um, in terms of finding Myrmica sabuliti. So what did they do? Well, Jeremy Thomas worked all this out and he worked out the way to get something of interest to find a butterfly with exactly the same flight period, with exactly the same time requirements, um, and he found those butterflies on an island off Sweden called Oland. Um, so he went to Oland and he took eggs, I got permission of course, um, and took eggs to rear on. There was no point collecting the larvae because he knew that there was no chance that the larvae would be adopted, um, or at least he thought that. Um, um, but he, uh, he, you know, because he'd obviously have to have them feeding on grubs and etc, etc. Um, so he took the eggs 
um, and uh, read, read them on um, and we went, through, there was a process of release there. What he did in uh, Cytex in 1983 um, was to release nine caterpillars, and as you can see there, seven adults emerged in 1984 and small numbers in 85 and 86. So you get the sense there, very small success rate because Cytex was rubbish and still pretty rubbish then. And they reintroduced, they introduced more, 200 larvae, 1986, 75, 80, in 90 emerged um, and continued on. Um, in Green Down, you can see 281 caterpillars released in 1992, and now at Green Down, you're looking at something like 10,000 adults as, a, as, a, as an example. At my site, um, when they released the larvae the previous year, uh, just like in the year, the summer, it was a rubbishy wet summer for the adults. Just as soon as they released the larvae on my site, the rain is just the heavens over. For three days um, and of course the ants just didn't do anything they just stayed in their uh, in their ant nests instead of heading off to try and find the larvae um, so you really hostage to um, some of those issues um, so Cytex poor flight weather uh, plus flight season weather in 2001 and 2002 failure to get the grazing regime right Cytex was too small anyway another example at Seacum um, introduction in 2000 very uh, 300 larvae released a few adults were released but the deluges of rain in the flying season just like at my site um, and then the, the drought impacting um, and as you can see here from 1987 to 1995 there were five introductions one of mine was one of the failures only two were successful and the problem was the Cotswolds, what they didn't realise was the butterfly they were releasing actually uh, was coming out at the wrong time, laying its eggs at the wrong time for the time of the time, because the time plants were flowering uh, later than the time plants in Somerset. Um, so they got it completely wrong there. Um, so what do we got? The future now looks bright. For all those problems, the future actually really does look bright. You've got 10,000 adults on 11 sites in 2006 and eggs found at 20. And much of this was not just reintroduction, but in a natural colonization. So by 20, 2008, there were 33 sites um, and there was a big program to uh, a funded program to restore lots of sites. Um, to make them better uh, for large blue. Um, but nonetheless, this process of natural colonization was also really, really important. So for, uh, Green Down, for example, um, the very fact that they were flying to the bottom of the hill actually was good because at the bottom of the hill is a railway. Um, and the railway was sucking the large blues along. Um, the, the trains were sucking the large blues along the railway. Uh, and they were colonising new spaces along the railway line. So serendipity again. And it just so turns out that some of those railway lines are even better uh, than the rest of the countryside for a whole raft of different reasons. So you can see 40 sites occupied in 2018 and 25,000 adults in 2018. Now, the reason why it went down to 19,000 adults in 2019 is because 25,000 adults was too many. So. Um, in 2018, there were instances of more than one adult, no, more than one larva being taken into an ant nest. So, you know, they suffered from this overpopulation issue, hence the decline in adults in 2019. So the story then is um, now that we've got uh, 34 sites in the Poldens, where once there were only three. Um, in the Cotswolds, where there were 33, there are now 10, uh, maybe a few more. Uh, South Devon, very, very, well, hardly nothing in South Devon. Uh, Dartmoor, they tried to, uh, tried reintroduction in Dartmoor, but they failed um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and same reason, I suppose, in a sense, they're just finding it too hard to restore the landscape of the North Atlantic coast because they can't get, the soils are too thin, uh, too shaly, um, and they can't get the right length of grass and the thyme to flower uh, and the Myrmica sabuleti. So again, you know, having lost them from there, uh, it might well be that it's a complete anomaly that they were there. Um, we maybe need to focus much more on uh, the other landscapes. So very quickly then, this is where this model comes in and I'm not gonna take you through the hieroglyphics, it doesn't really matter. Um, but at the point here is that the survival, AT plus one is next year's number of adults 
is dependent upon this year's number of adults and the survival and the the the, uh, the shape, whichever species of ant, Sabronodis or scabuliti, um, and then the other things like oviposition and drought mortality and things like that. So what they did was they predicted, for example, at Collard Hill, 910 adults, and they found uh, that they actually were getting a thousand to five thousand. So woohoo, that's great. You know, they worked out that the model worked. And even better, um, when you chart it, they they charted it back on site X, the left hand side of the top graph, and they actually found a good fit in terms of what the population decline was. Um, and then they realized that site X was always going to be limited using that model. Um, and it's a logarithmic model, by the way. Um, so they then worked out, plotted it against green down, and they found that green down you know, uh, uh, behaved in the way that they expected it to. Um, and what you can see on the bottom left is that a couple of the railway lines, I said that green down is possibly one of the best sites, uh, a couple of the railway lines are even better uh, for, for large blues. So, you know, kind of a brilliant success story there in terms of science and ecology. So just uh, nearing, nearing the end here, um, a couple of bits and bobs, um, because this is a really, ex really exciting story about evolution in action. Remember I said that Co the Cotswolds is cooler than the Somerset landscape, and that's really important um, because you've obviously got issues in terms of Myrmica sabuleti. You've also got issues in terms of flight periods and the flowering of the thyme plant. And it turns out actually, large blue zone to lay their eggs on marjoram, so especially in the railway cutting. So it's not just the thyme plant. Again, this is one of these things where, because we've, we've discovered them on thyme plant, we thought they're only on thyme plant. Well, actually, where the grass is longer and thyme doesn't exist, then if the marjoram does and it flowers slightly later, um, then the large blues can exist because they can lay their eggs on marjoram. Um, and it turns out that The females are actually evolving to become better. But maybe there's, you know, kind of a one of these things where, you know, it's an evolutionary pressure because they're not surviving. Then they're going through the, you know, there's a mutation release, and because they're these better dispersers are, are, are becoming more successful, then this evolutionary process is, is accelerating. And so it's turning out that actually there are two races emerging. You've got a race which is emerging as an early flight period, which is uh, laying eggs on time, and a late fl uh, flight period, which is laying its eggs on marjoram. And what they're doing in the Cotswolds now um, is releasing, um, and as, other, as well as other places, is releasing both races of large blue to take advantage of, and effectively, um, I can't remember what the phrase is, uh, hedging your bets, that's the one. Um, so uh, Rodborough Common is the last major reintroduction. Uh, 2019, they released 1,100 larvae, and in 2020, they got 750 adults, which is a fantastic success story. And there's a picture of Rodborough Common to give you an idea of the, of the place. It's a brilliant place. I used to work for the National Trust and uh, I know Rodborough Common well. So uh, if you get the chance, I really encourage you to, to kind of go there. But the, the real place to go is actually Collard Hill because that's the public place. So final slide then um, with a, fine, a couple of things I just wanted to show you afterwards. Um, this is a fantastic conservation success story of people understanding and learning animal behavior, that detective story, um, the micro niche detective story. There's an issue here about understanding policy. Why was it that people, you know, didn't have, couldn't keep cattle? Why was it that people were changing to arable landscapes from a dairy landscape? So we need to understand the impacts. There's the aspect of understanding people. One of the things I had to do um, I was given uh, pictures uh, on my site of butterfly collectors, because you can kind of imagine I was one of only those, those five sites. And what they were really, really worried about was they knew there were half a dozen people out there who would want to come and collect a large blue when it was in flight. Um, so understanding the dynamics of these people, was as well as others, uh, was really, really important. We talk about it as being a reintroduction. Well, of course, it isn't really a reintroduction. This is a translocation. Um, it's a slightly different race uh, to that which existed, um, but nonetheless, it's one that actually has become successful. Um, and actually, there's, there's a suggestion that we should reintroduce them back from Somerset to Oland um, because they've been struggling. And so that's a nice little irony, isn't it? 
And the final thing is it's not just about the large blue. Um, the benefits here have been really, really significant. So uh, flowers like the threatened flowers, like the cut leaf germander, have benefited uh, from this kind of conservation action. They benefited on these large blue sites. A whole raft of orchids, fly orchids, uh, green winged orchids, frog orchids, and now flowering and profusion on these sites because of this management. Other blues and kind of Adonis blue, Chalk Hill blue, fritillaries like the uh, uh, the Duke of Burgundy fritillary, these have all proliferated because of, on these sites, because of this management. Um, so the large blue is a flagship totemic um, Trojan horse, if you like, for creating conservation success stories like the tiger beetle and the western bee fly, which would probably have disappeared if we hadn't had the reintroduction of the large blue. Um, and just if you're really interested in this sort of stuff, just some, some quick, I'm not going to touch on them, um, but you'll be able to see, a, you know, recall a video of this. Um, there's a, uh, a YouTube video, which is the large blue, how undergrazing led to its extinction. I think if you type that into Google uh, onto YouTube, you'll find that. This is hyperlinked, um, but um, uh, I haven't really got time, unfortunately, because I've been talking too much to show you that. There's another one. Um, which is uh, my favourite entomologist, Matthew Oates, um, taking you through the large blue butterfly at Collard Hill, which is a brilliant little five minute introduction to the large blue. Um, there's another one from uh, a warden at Collard, I think, um, called Saving the Large Blue Butterfly, where the, 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 the warden takes you through their work and what they've been doing. Um, and if you're really interested, then the National Trust won't run a blog uh, on the large blue, although they're not running it this year, unfortunately. But uh, you can still see the previous year's uh, blog stories uh, in terms of the large blue. Uh, and that's it. Um, so hope, I do apologise for talking forever, um, but I hope I've given you a good idea of the, uh, you know, kind of this really amazing uh, story of, uh, of conservation. And uh, I've got some, yeah, there, there are some questions. Thanks, John. That was really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, there are a few questions. Can you see those? I can, yeah. 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 Shall I, sh yeah, shall I take them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, 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 hopefully I've, um, thank you, Lucy. Uh, hopefully I've um, I've covered why, how is the grass kept short? It's through cattle grazing. Um, the sheep are important because they help to keep the turf short. You really have to get the grazing right, um, both in the winter and in the late summer, because otherwise the, uh, it's not just the time, it's the length of grass for the ant nests. So it's really critical for the ant nests just as much of the time. Um, where are the poldens? The po Poldens are in uh, Somerset, um, so if you know Cheddar, um, if you, uh, the Poldens are basically a limestone uh, scarp of hills, if you like, which run from Cheddar all the way down to Wells. Um, so uh, almost down towards Glastonbury. Uh, as you look north from Glastonbury, you'll see the Poldens. Um, and it, it, no, it should actually say Poldens, not Polders, because Polders are a Dutch landscape. Um, but anyway, that's fine, Annie. Uh, David says, can we expect hope to see large blue on any of our nature reserves? Um, I'm afraid I don't think we can, simply because the landscape is not right. I mean, we certainly have Myrmica sabuliti in the landscape, um, but, uh, well, actually having said that, with climate change, you, you might well find in 20, 30, 50, um, that there might be uh, large blue in this landscape. As I said before, you know, at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries, there were large blues in Northamptonshire. So it is entirely possible, you know, in the future. Um, but, you know, who knows? Uh, right, um, any any sites of, of large blues or any other blues? Yes, there, in terms of other blues, there are plenty of uh, uh, sites with other blues, and you know, sort of common blues, holly blues, um, and, um, if you log on to Nature Spot, um, you'll get uh, you'll get a good a, a good view of the uh, of the uh, the landscape for blues. Um, uh, the Nature Spot is a great uh, a great source for that. Does the presence of green woodpeckers cause much of a problem for large blue? 
No, it doesn't. Now, this here's an interesting difference. Um, the, the greenwood pecker tends to feed on Lasius flavus, um, the flagus. So it's kind of one that creates these domes uh, upon which it sits uh, and, you know, kind of feeds, uh, you know, on the ants that way. Um, Myrmica salbuliti is a burrowing ant and lives well down in the ground. So it tends not to, to, to kind of dig in to, to, to get to the grubs. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there, there is certainly a bit of an issue there. Um, but it's not not been it's not that significant of a problem. Um, any other questions? There's one here about do you link up with the National Trust? I'm not quite sure the meaning of that question. I'm afraid. If uh, if uh, Jay Murphy has anything else on that question, just to explain what that is, um, then. Uh, in terms of in terms of we as an organisation, do we link up with the National Trust? Well, actually, the unfortunately, the National Trust doesn't really do a great deal in our area at the moment, um, so uh, we don't we don't really uh, link up with them in that sense to get the extra landscape. Um, as the one as wildlife trust as a perspective, we do yes. As a wildlife trust network, we do, um, but as I say, we we don't here because. Uh, although having said that, uh, let's let's be fair. Um, Natalie uh, you know, at Dimmonsdale, um, you know, kind of Cork Abbey way, we do an awful lot of work together with the Na National Trust and Seven Trent Water in that Cork Abbey, Abbey landscape. But then, you know, we're hostage to where the National Trust has their properties in that sense. So that's a good example of where Natalie um, is working together. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, in terms of getting that extra landscape connectivity. So yes, we're working with them in terms of cattle grazing and all that sort of stuff. Okay, does anybody have any more questions that they want to ask John before we finish off for the evening? Oh, we've got one from Jane Simmons. Gosh, Jane, I wish I knew and I simply don't. Um, there are lots, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are lots. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I wouldn't know actually, to be honest, you'd probably have to just Google the answer to that one, because there are so <laughs> many, so many species of butterfly in the world. Um, they really are. You know, we, we are so depauperate uh, in, in butterfly numbers because we're an island. We're a small island. We are towards the pole. Um, you know, we've got several, several, well, we've got a couple of thousand species of moth, but only, you know, kind of 60 odd species of butterfly. Um, but uh, across the world, there are loads. So uh, Google that in and you know, let us know. <laughs> Great, okay. If nobody else has got anything they'd like to ask, then we will let John get going. Um, I've got some nice comments in the chat saying how interesting it was. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening and thank you for sticking through to the end. I did see 73 still at the end when I finished, so it was a long slog, but we covered an awful lot of ground. We did. Thank you very much, John. That was really